How do you go from struggling actress to award-winning producer of eight successful feature films? We'll find out today as we talk with Alexandra Boylan. We'll discuss her transition into independent filmmaking, as well as her shift into faith-based family filmmaking. We'll hear insights into distribution and marketing, and a whole lot more. But first, can I ask you a favor? Would you please follow this podcast right now on your podcast player so you don't miss an episode? And if you think others would be interested in listening, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That will really help us get off to a strong start with this new podcast. This is the Faith and Family Filmmakers Podcast, helping filmmakers who share a Christian worldview stay in touch, informed, and inspired. Quiet on set. Rolling. Your hosts, Jeffrey and Jacqueline Witt. Hey there, welcome to the Faith and Family Filmmakers Podcast, where we talk to individuals in the filmmaking industry with a Christian worldview. Today's guest is Alexandra Boylan. Alexandra Boylan is a dynamic, award-winning filmmaker, writer, producer, and actress who has been trailblazing through Hollywood for nearly two decades. Born and raised in Massachusetts, Boylan is known for her fearless pursuit of meaningful content. In addition to her numerous acting credits, Alexandra co-created the Boylan Sisters Production Company, a successful film studio that focuses on faith-based, family-friendly content. Their first feature-length film, Catching Faith, streamed on Netflix for two years and has spawned a sequel, as well as paved the way for other critically acclaimed movies such as The Greatest Inheritance and Switched. Their latest venture, Identity Crisis, also serves as a basis for a young adult novel, which she co-authored with her sister and business partner, Andrea. Alexandra has previously published the widely regarded how-to guide entitled Create Your Own Career in Hollywood, Advice from a Struggling Actress Who Became a Successful Producer, and is an active member of Influence Women and Women in Film Los Angeles. Welcome to the show. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So we've just met, so this is actually perfect for me to get to know you also. Tell me your backstory. I mean, I've seen some of your movies, but I want to know, like, how did you get to where you're at? Yeah, so I, well, I grew up in Massachusetts. I am a minister's kid, and from a very young age, I loved the entertainment industry. I loved movies. I loved everything, and At 19 years old, I packed up my Toyota Corolla and I moved to California all by myself to pursue acting. And I had a big dream to become a movie star like so many people do. (laughs) And, you know, I had such a tough time in L.A. I didn't know anybody. I became homeless after a year, lived in my car for a month. And I just kept praying. I was like, God, I thought this is what you wanted for my life. And after 10 years in L.A., pounding the pavement as an act, as pursuing acting, but really just waiting tables. I actually packed up my Toyota Corolla again, and I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico in 2009. And I went out there to, the film industry was booming, but I really went out there to kind of re-surrender my life to the Lord. And I was like, okay, whatever I'm doing for my life is not working. So what do you want me to do, God? Maybe I was wrong. I wasn't supposed to be an actress. And when I moved out to New Mexico, I met all these incredible independent filmmakers. And then I was like, wait a minute, why am I waiting for someone to choose me? Why don't I pick myself and make a movie and put myself in the starring role? So a group of us got together in New Mexico. Literally, I paid out of pocket for my first feature film. About five of us shot a thriller called Home Sweet Home about a girl returns to her childhood abandoned house and there's squatters living in it and they don't want to leave. And We really kind of made it to show our parents or to prove that we could make a feature and so I could give myself the lead. Well, I ended up moving back to Los Angeles after filming that movie and I got a sales agent and we sold that movie at American Film Market to RLJ Releasing and we got a major distribution deal. And I was like, oh, I I like this making my own stuff because I have such a strong work ethic. And I realized that as an actor, you cannot work hard enough for someone to pick you. But I could put all of my creativity and my go-getterness into a movie and I can see it through the end. And building and making our first feature film was such a learning process because you don't know what you don't know until you've done it. And I'm so glad we did it. And I learned and we taught ourselves how to do it. And then 
We sold the movie. And then I actually had written another horror movie and I brought it to my sales agent. And I said, hey, do you want to package this with the other film or should we do another horror? And he said to me, he said, absolutely not. Don't do another horror movie. This was back in 2011. He said, the, the market will be oversaturated next year with horror. You should move into faith-based family films. And I was like, wow, whoa. Like, I felt like God like struck the table and was like, this is what I want you to do. And I said, okay. Um, and he was like, if you could do the quality of your thriller in the faith space, you will stand out. And he goes, I'll get the money if you make the movie. The only requirement is football. So I walked away from that meeting. I, always, I say yes, always say yes. I called my sister who lives in Wisconsin. I said, do you want to help me with this faith-based film? Our only requirement is football. We looked at the landscape of the faith-based space back in 2011. We did not see any women in starring roles, following a female-led story. So we went back to our sales agent, who our executive producer, and we said, yes, we'll do this, but we wanted to star a woman. And he said, oh, you can't do that. There's no numbers in the marketplace to back up a female-driven faith-based film. What? And I said, yeah, but that's because nobody's doing it. So maybe if we do it, we can prove there's a huge audience. The women are the buyers of these. So he said, okay, I trust you. So we wrote a film called Catching Faith. I ended up putting everything I owned in storage, got rid of my apartment in Los Angeles, lived on the road for one year to make that movie a reality because we only had a $75,000 all-in budget. Wow. And uh, we all went out and we actually shot it in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, in my sister's hometown. The whole town rallied around this movie and we filmed it. We finished it. We were able to sell it to the same distribution company that bought Home Sweet Home to RLJ Releasing for triple the budget. It went on to become their top five consistent selling movie wow. and it spawned a sequel. So we were like, huh, I think we're on to something making movies. And yeah. Okay. Let me ask you something here before we carry on. Cause like I'm sitting on a question. So you said you paid for your first movie out of pocket. Are you comfortable to say how much your budget was for your first movie? All in, by the end of the process, I had put $10,000 into it. And you were able to sell that and make that back? And we sold it for double. How long was it? How many minutes? Uh, it's a full feature film. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank what was that you. movie called? That's called Home Sweet Home. It's available on Tubi and Amazon and Apple TV. It was on the shelves of Walmart. And what's really cool is I'm the star of it. So when we uh -huh. got distribution, I was like, I finally have an acting role. <laughs> Which was your role to begin with. Exactly. Cool. So, um, but then I just really fell in love with creating movies. And it's really funny. It's true that, you know, for faith wise, when I gave my life to God, he gave me my life back tenfold with the ability to write and produce. And I didn't even know I had all these skills until I started trying it. And I loved it so much that now I'm really more focused on the writing and producing than I am acting. I mean, I've done the Marvel. I was in the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and I've done things here and there, but really I focus on creating content and I care so much about the audience. And I really care about creating female driven content and teen girls. And every time my sister and I create a project, we're looking at the landscape of the culture and how can we speak into culture? It takes a long time to make a movie, as you guys know. And we raise all the private investment ourselves. So my executive producer, he did Catching Faith 1 and Wish for Christmas for us. And then after Wish for Christmas, he said, you know what? I'm really busy with my sales company and I don't have time to raise the money. So then we became, oh, okay, so we write the movie. We're going to have to produce the movie. And first we have to raise the money for the movie and then get distribution. So we really ended up just continuing to teach wow. ourselves how to make our own films, have, a, have control over our career. And even when we've taken our scripts to studios, we've been passed on. And I'm sure it was a blessing because a lot of our films, we got to take it from conception to completion without anybody coming in and changing the story or telling us who gets casted, all the things we got to have complete control over our projects. And like my teen girl movie, Switch, that was very successful. It's won a lot of awards about two girls in high school that switched bodies all about love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. We took that out to studios and they all made offers on it. But the number one requirement was that I had to make it raunchy and I had to have the girls do inappropriate things. So I walked away from, oh, one deal was 2.5 million and I walked away and said, I will not 
speak to young girls in that way. My whole thing is empowering young women. So we ended up raising private investment, made that movie exactly how we wanted to, and put a message into the world that is so important. After Catching Faith, we made Wish for Christmas. We went to our hometown in Massachusetts. I used my father's church and my graduating high school. And uh, we go into small towns and have towns rally around us because it's the only way that we've been able to do our films on such low budgets. And I always say you don't need a lot of people. You just need the right people. And we have the right people behind the camera. And I have the most incredible poster company, which your posters are one of the most important parts of your film because that's how you're going to sell it. And then from there, we did Catching Faith 2, and then we shot Switched, and then we did The Greatest Inheritance, and then we just did Identity Crisis, and wow. all of our films have recouped their money to their investors. Yay. I'm so excited for you. Wow. Thank you. And that's where we've been able to roll them over, and a lot of our investors have come back. And I mean, definitely right. for our films, a lot of people are investing because they care about the message of our movies. And we are one of the rare studios making very clean, inspirational movies for teen girls without anything that a mother has to worry about. Um, and then also in between all those movies, in 2015, a couple of us decided to go back to our roots of completely guerrilla style independent filmmaking because we wanted to test out self-distribution. So we made a movie called At Your Own Risk. It's on Tubi, it's on Amazon. We made it for $1,000 production budget. We went to the New Mexico desert, shot a feature, four of us. We had our director and the cinematographer, and the director held the boom, and my friend and I star in it. And we did that movie. Actually, all in budget was $5,000, and we were able to get an aggregator, and that aggregator put us on Tubi, Amazon, all over the place. And we actually own 100% of the profit of that movie, so we see money and we were just kind of testing out self-distribution. So I've done eight features now in all very different levels of budgets and crew and cast. And Okay, I've got some questions now. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I know a lot of people would, they would rather start with a short instead of a feature. Do you have anything to say on that? Yes, absolutely. I think we did a lot of shorts and web series and things back in 2010 with the team that I made Home Sweet Home with. So we definitely were practicing. I want to move into directing. So last year I directed a short film that I wrote, got some friends together, shot it in my house, just kind of was like, I want to learn how. To, I mean, I, I sat behind the camera monitor on all my films, but I'd never actually directed. So I think shorts are a great way to start. But I would look at a short film as a learning process, not as I'm going to sell this and it's going to make money. You know, I think it's really just so you can hone your skill and work with a team and find out if you guys all like each other. Because for us, our home sweet home team, it was really that we all got along and worked really well together. And we have worked with the same. I have worked with some of the same teammates since 2010 on Home Sweet Home that I'm still working with now on my films, eight films later. So shorts are great to hone your skill and to see if you can take something from conception to completion. But I wouldn't stay there too long if you feel ready because shorts cost a lot of money too. Sometimes you can just make a feature for the same amount of money and then you have a, a chance to sell it or get an aggregator and get it out there to have a feature. You know, and talking about working with the same people, as you mentioned a moment ago, it just reminds me in so many parts of this industry that it really is about relationships. And when you've got those relationships that work, um, mm -hmm. you don't mess with that. For those beginning uh, it's an important thing to know. It's about relationships and not necessarily being discovered. It's about getting to know people. Yeah. That's such a good point because the industry is all about who you know, but it's how you know them. And it's building a relationship and not just asking people for things. I try to give back as much as I ask. And everyone who's worked with me, even when we had nothing, like Home Sweet Home, we had very little money for post-production but every person who worked with me, I hired them for the next one. And every time our budgets have gotten bigger, I've been able to hire those people. So I say take care of people because that's really important that if somebody came and helped you out when you didn't have anything, that if you enjoyed working with them, bring them back and then pay them. And we've had the same sound designer, the same composer, the same editor. Um, I've worked with the same poster company since my very first film. And the sales agent, I've worked with Ryan Keller, my sales agent on 
even though he, he didn't raise the money anymore, he still stayed on as our executive producer. When I'd raise the money, he handled all the money and then he would take our movie out and sell it. So a lot of these people I met when they were starting their career and then they were building their career up and I was able to go with them because my sales agent was just starting and now he's very successful at vertical entertainment. And since you've gotten into this self-distribution, you tested that out. Did it become something where you were thinking, you know what, I like this, I'm going to do it? Or did it show you, you know, I'm not into the self-distribution? Like, where are you at with that? Yeah, I go back and forth because I do think when you sell your movie to a major distribution company, like we worked with RLJ Releasing, Vertical Entertainment, Pure Flix, Universal, um, you're still, if you don't get the deal for marketing, you still have to do all your own marketing. And so when you self-distribute, at least if you're doing all the marketing, you know the money's coming back to you. Whereas like if you go with Vertical or a, a, a distribution company that doesn't pay up front for your movies, which is happening, like we used to get upfront deals, but now they're not doing upfront deals as much. They're just taking your film and putting it out there for you. And then we have to do all the marketing and then the money's getting funneled back to the distribution company. But there's definitely things that they can do that I can't do or self-distribution homepage on major platforms. So Identity Crisis, we decided to work with Vertical Entertainment. Again, our new our new teen girl movie that we wrote a novel for, available on Amazon. They were able to get us homepage on Amazon, homepage on Vudu and Apple TV. So that's something I couldn't do. And getting homepage advantage is huge because that's how people are going to find you. So I go kind of back and forth. I think it depends on your budget, depends on your investors. It depends on your executive producers. Like you all have to be on the same board of how you're going to distribute your movie. And everybody has to be comfortable with knowing that, you know, if you have a million dollar budget, they want to know that there's an opportunity to recoup that. And sometimes going with a major distribution company means you're going to have a better chance to get on those platforms and then a better chance for homepage advantage. You know, if like Identity Crisis, my executive producer did not feel comfortable doing self-distribution. He was like, I feel more comfortable going with a distribution company that has a relationships with platforms. And I respect that. It makes sense. It's a big risk to do it on your own too. Yeah. The way I understand it is if you are going to be working with a distribution company or desire to work with the distribution company, you have to have that relationship and maybe even the arrangement made before you make the movie. Because sometimes there's uh, various requirements they have, whether it's uh, budget, A-list actor, B-list actor, a number of things that is going to either make it or break it with regards to them taking you. The movie's already made. They then have no say and you may not get that distribution where you want it. Yeah, but it's really hard. That would be like an actual deal ahead of time. I have never been able to secure a distribution deal before with the script. Uh, the only one I was was Catching Faith 2 because RLJ requested the movie, but they actually would not upfront the cost. All they right. would do was do a buyback deal. So they signed a contract saying, once we make the movie, they will buy it from us. So right. we still had to go out, raise private investment, and then the distribution company bought it when it was completely finished. And their only requirement was they wanted Bill and Bill to come back. That was all they said. We don't want it without Bill because originally Bill wasn't going to be in the sequel. And then the distribution company said, if he doesn't do it, we're not buying it. So we were like, okay, forget it. We're going to go get Bill and Bill. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is Dan with the Christian Worldview Film Festival. The festival this year is March 11th through 15th at Sherwood Church in Albany, Georgia. We have over 35 sessions scheduled on topics like screenwriting, lighting, AI, and post-production from speakers like Alex and Stephen Kendrick, Bruce Marciano, Jacqueline Witt, and many more. Go to cwvff.com for more information and for tickets. And okay, so you have gotten into making films. You mentioned this also specifically for female young adults. And what is it that, that makes you be drawn to that? Well, I just feel like the more and more I look at the landscape of what entertainment is telling young girls, it's really bothering me. And so instead of complaining about it, I'm doing something about it. And I am creating an alternative to some of these messaging that we are telling young girls, they're only worthy if a boy likes them, or they're only this. And also the other thing is when we looked and saw that there were no female-led faith-based films, we started doing that. And then we saw that there wasn't a lot of YA content in the faith space that was like Mean Girls meets Freaky Friday for Christian girls. And they don't want to miss out. They want to get to see the hip and fun things. So that was our goal, was to make a Disney-like movie 
that spoke into a Christian worldview point of view. And Switch went on to do so well and sell all over the world. And we get messages from mothers now just trusting our brand, being like, I know if I turn on your movie, I don't have to worry that it's going to throw in something inappropriate. And so it's so important to me that we change the narrative for young girls and that we speak life into them. I, I see euphoria in some of these shows and I'm just like, why would we tell young girls to behave this way? So we're focusing on giving them life-giving truths. Also, you know, in the entertainment industry and in films, we really pit girls up against each other so much. I've seen that my whole career. And so our films are bringing women together and showing relationships between young girls, which is all about the relationships with their friends. And boys are not even really part of that movie. It's really about friendships. And if we feel like if we can speak into that to the girls at a young age, then as they grow up, we'll be changing culture of how women treat each other. And like Identity Crisis, which follows a shy science whiz in college who struggles with imposter syndrome and confidence, and she figures out how to clone herself and send her clone off to do all the things she's afraid of, only to discover that God already created her the perfect version of herself. And there are so many beautiful messages in this movie and book about you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are precious. And um, I just feel like we can't make enough of these to combat some of the other negative messaging young girls are getting. Thank you for doing that. I was one of those uh, young girls that fell into the messages from the culture, and it totally threw me off course in life. And, you know, it was only in my mid-20s when I was able to rededicate my life to God and then started to get back on track and then realizing I had been believing the lies of the culture. And yeah. so I really appreciate the movies that you're making. I would have loved to have had them when I was a teenager or a young adult. And right. I have been Thank recommending you. them. You know, actually, I'm part of a, a homeschool group on Facebook. And every now and then they'll ask for recommendations for movies. And so, yeah, I shared your website and I told them, like, just keep following this production company. They are making movies that are exactly what you want to show your kids. Yeah, thank you. It, Yeah, we need so many more. And the other thing is all of our movies come with companion materials. So we publish Bible studies, youth groups, high wow. school curriculums. So theboylandsisters.com is our website and all of our resources are available. Them Some are free, some are paid for because we want to equip families to be able to have conversations. So it isn't just about the movie. You can watch the movie, but then you can do studies and say, what does it look like? Each of our film has a message. Catching Faith is about integrity, telling the truth when no one's looking. So Elijah Project's study is all about that. And so to us, it's really important to not just have a film, but have resources for families to connect with their kids. And again, just the hipness. Our movies have cool costumes. Like we want the girls to go and want to share in a slumber party. And I think the other really cool thing is that we've been able to hit the mainstream audi audience with what we're doing. Amy Grant is my hero. Like as a young girl, she was my Madonna, but she was so hip and cool. I was like, thank goodness I have Amy Grant because otherwise my parents wouldn't let me watch or see or listen to anything. And that's where I feel like today, I'm like, that's what I'm going to do with the entertainment. What Amy Grant did for music for Christians is what I want to do for entertainment for Christian girls. So thank you. We've gotten some really great information from you today as well. And I know a lot of what you already talked about touches on the book that you mentioned earlier that you've written, Create Your Own yeah. Career in Hollywood. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's available on Amazon. And, you know, I literally created my career from scratch, didn't know anything, kind of taught myself, found amazing people. And then as my film started coming out and we were succeeding, I'd get so many messages of people being like, can I take you to coffee? Can I pick your brain? And in the beginning, I actually did go to coffee with a lot of people and it just got so overwhelming. So I was like, maybe I could just put all this information into a book. And the other cool thing about the book is that I was writing for a site called Ms. and the Biz. It's an online um, platform that inspires and encourages women to get behind the camera and tell stories. And I had wrote for that site for six years. And a lot of times my articles were while I was literally in the trenches making a movie, and so I pulled a lot of my articles and also wrote some other stuff to kind of help equip people. This is my love letter back to young people who are like, how do I even start to make a movie? 
And instead of going to coffee with everybody, I'm like, go buy my book, read it, and then write me an email and I'm happy to answer a question. But I think the other thing is sometimes people want to pick my brain, but they don't know the questions they need to ask yet. They don't know yet because they haven't done it. So then I'm like, instead of us wasting any time, read the book, then you can ask me questions. So that's where the book came from. And I really do love inspiring filmmakers to take their career into their own hands because waiting around for people to pick you, it's just never going to, and no one owes us anything. So it's our responsibility to go after what we want to do. I just hate hearing people complain all the time. I can't get this. I can't get that. I'm like, then do it yourself. Or if they won't let you sit at the table, build your own table. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so much of life is like that. Uh, It's the same with musicians. It's the same with so many careers. You can uh, wait to be discovered, which doesn't happen. You, You go and make it happen. You make it happen. Yeah. I mean, still after eight feature films, I'm still hustling. The hustle never ends. So it's not like my phone blowing up. I'm still out there hustling and proving that there is an audience for the work I'm doing. And and it's it's a challenge, but I love it. And whatever project you're either writing or going to produce, I always say you have to love it yourself because that'll bring you through all the hard days. And then you're going to be with that movie for the rest of your life. I'm still promoting Catching Faith. I'm still promoting Wish for Christmas. And so you have to love what you do and you have to really care about it. I I think phoning it in just isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. It's too challenging of an industry. you got to be passionate about what you're doing. Yeah. Yes, this is not a get-rich-quick industry. (laughs) No. (laughs) Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) Before we finish up this portion of our interview, I'd like to take a moment to invite you to go deeper with us in our discussion with Alexandra Boylan in Part 2, our Members Only episode. Alexandra talks about the importance of your first 10 minutes, getting distribution for your film, and some of the elements that are critical in securing that distribution. You'll notice that the first four Members Only episodes are available for free in your podcast player. If you like the members' content and would like to continue receiving these bonus episodes, Please support the podcast by becoming a supporting member. You can do so at faffpodcast.com slash support. That's F-A-F-F podcast.com slash support. You can also go there if you'd like to leave a one-time donation. Well, is there anything else that, any last words you would like to share with our audience uh, before we wrap up? We've got all of your links in the show notes, but also let us know or let our listeners know where they can find you. Yes. So the Boylansisters.com is all of our faith-based family films. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Alexandra Boylan, and you can write to me and I'll write you back. And uh, yeah, and all of our movies are available on Amazon. Tubi has At Your Own Risk and Home Sweet Home. And that's good because that's a free platform for people. And then um, I guess my last bits of advice is to just do it. Uh, people say, what would you tell yourself now? I wish I had started making my own movies when I first moved to L.A. I wish that if I could, I would have started in my 20s. I started in my 30s, and I've done really well in the past 10 years. But I say start right now, and you don't need a lot of people. You don't even need a lot of equipment. You need a camera and a boom and someone who really knows how to work with lighting. We had no lights for Home Sweet Home. And in fact, because we had no lights, we made the whole movie in the daytime. It's a horror thriller. And we just didn't have the money for lights. And the distribution company was like, this is so unique. You made a movie that's a horror movie in the daytime. It works. So it's like anytime you think you're having something that isn't going, work it. Use it to your advantage, you know? Go to the New Mexico desert. You don't need a light there. The light is beautiful. If you watch our movie Home Sweet Home, we have no lights. That is all natural, naturally lit by the desert. You use what you have and you make it work. And you just keep going and be a finisher and find people who are finishers. Uh Everyone can start something, but not everybody can finish something. And that is one thing I have. If I say I'm going to do something, I finish it. And I have surrounded myself with other people who are finishers, especially post-production. Because a lot of people will bail out at post. And so you really need to find incredible people that will see the movie all the way through the end. That's really good advice. Well, thank you so much for this interview and sharing your wisdom. And I am looking forward to getting that book. You're you're actually putting the bug in me right now. Like I always just wanted to be a writer. I had no interest in producing, but I'm starting to realize maybe producing would allow me to to do more with what I'm writing. 
you know, to give yeah. them more of the freedom and the independence and, and to actually have that vision the way I see it to bring that to life. So yeah. you're getting me thinking. And then when you're producing, you get to crew up the movie. So you get to work with the people you want to work with. And you get to cast the movie. So you get to be sitting in there with the director or if you direct it and choosing who you want to play the part. So, I mean, that's the other thing about being an independent filmmaker. You really do have to understand the entire process of making a movie. But that's why you start and you learn. It's so rewarding. It's like you've made a baby. And then you send that baby out in the world. And you're like, I did it. And then don't go look at the reviews. <laughs> well, I just mean everyone loves to hate. You got to put right. it out, know that it's found the audience that it's for, but that'll stop people too. They'll get a couple of bad reviews and then they're like, oh, I don't want to do it again. I'm like, nope, just keep going, keep going. Yep. And you'll build the audience and the people who love what you're doing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Perfect. You're yeah. welcome. Could be so much value in here for our listeners. And uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. This was fun. Well, we'll do it again sometime. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Faith and Family Filmmakers Podcast. If you would like email reminders about newly released episodes and more, please sign up at faffpodcast.com slash email. That's faffpodcast.com slash email. Bringing filmmakers together for faith and family. That's a wrap. <laughs>